This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Global stocks head for their worst week since March, and the euro falls after dismal PMI data from Germany and France thrust the threat of a recession back into focus. U.S. jobless claims climbed to the highest level in nearly two years, suggesting a cooling job market. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen sees a risk of a U.S. recession diminishing. Plus, shares in Siemens Energy plunge after it took back its profit guidance due to mounting issues and its Spanish wind turbine units. Now, first thing is first, so let's check on the markets. A lot of the focus, of course, is on those numbers, what it means for global uh, interest rates. And we're also getting those euro area June services, PMI falling to 52.4. That's falling more than expected. We had forecasts of 54.5. It's coming at 52.4. Now, remember, everything above 50 still in indicates a, um, well, not a contraction expansion, but is lower than expected. What this means is that watch out for yields. Yields overall had already sunk on the previous PMI data, which is France and Germany. It's basically heightened investors' concern about a recession. Investors today definitely fleeing into the safety of bonds and sold uh, some of the stocks as there's a lurch towards this higher interest rate through the week. And this week, manufacturing data heightened anxiety that higher rates will tip economies into a recession. We're also seeing a repricing of what the ECB could do from now until year end. Euro dollar, let's look at euro dollar if we have it. There you go, 108.72. And uh, the rally in European bonds also sent the five year German bond yields plummeting as much as 15 basis points to 2.49%, really putting them on course for the biggest drop since April. Now, to talk about all of this, joining us, Bloomberg's Zoe Schneeweiss in Zurich. So, Zoe, break down the data for us. How complicated? Does this make it to, to understand the impact that interest rate hikes so far have had on the economy? Well, we've been seeing an impact from interest rate hikes on manufacturing for months now. What's, what's now, what we now are noticing is that services also are being impacted. And that means that the overall number oh, it just stayed about that vital 50 um, number that um, separates contraction and um, expansion, but still it's very close to a stagnation. So that overall, in the, if we remember, the euro area did have a winter recession, a very mild winter recession, 0 point, minus 0 0.1 in the fourth quarter and in the first quarter, but that was a recession. Now we were hoping for a rebound this quarter. These numbers just show that this will be a very, very weak rebound. And it just shows that this is the price you pay. This is the price the ECB was willing to pay when they went on this unprecedented tightening um, spree that started almost a year ago. Uh, so what does this mean for what the ECB is looking at? So there is there, you know, if you look at philosophically what central banks do, do they pause for a bit to really try and see exactly where it ends up? Or does it have more of an impact on inflation if they keep on pushing ahead and then stop in September? So um, if we look at the inflation um, expectation or the inflation um, uh, suggestions from these PMI numbers, they show that if it was only about controlling goods inflation, the ECB now could be clinking glasses and cheering. The issue is services. In services, inflation still, it, prices still are getting stronger. And that is just very bad news for the ECB. So um, that July rate hike, um, it, that supports them in the July rate hike. Overall, when you think about the whole way that the ECB um, moves the economy, um, influences the economy, the idea is that, these, that if the economy get, slows down, that that will actually feed through and also feed through to prices. But these data just show that this is not quite happening, especially this feed through to service inflation is something that will be worrying them as the underlying inflation gauge that they look at has a big services component. Zoe, thank you so much. Zoe Schneeweiss, of course, stays with us to discuss all of these central bank intricacies. Also joining us, Thomas Villadek, Chief European Economist at T. Rowe Price. Thomas, thank you for joining us. If you look at what the ECB has been doing, has been saying, and some of the fight against inflation, do, do we have a definitive or close to definitive answer on how long it takes for some of the price hikes to get through? And so what should the ECB be doing in this kind of situation? So there are certainly lags and I mean yesterday in the statement we saw the Bank of England admit that second round effects are more persistent in response to these inflation pressures in Europe and I think the ECB is in a similar place. 
So just because we saw this week real economy data today, as far as I know, employment data there is still quite robust. I think it is quite possible that the ECB will continue to be hawkish and it is quite, still quite possible that we see a 4% interest rate from them in September. Okay, so markets are definitely, and I want to get also Zoe on this, but Thomas, it's very clear that the markets are now saying, look, we're worrying um, about the possibility of a recession. Are markets overreacting or are we going to see also ECB members thinking the same? So I think markets are right to be worried about a recession. My own forecast suggests that European services PMIs will fall even further from here, mainly as a result of the pass-through from the tight macrofinancing environment the ECB has created yeah. in the past couple of months. Um, so I think they're right to be worried. However, we have to remember that the main target of the ECB is price stability. Mm -hmm. And what we really need to be watching is momentum and services inflation. If this doesn't come down materially over the next couple of months, it is likely that the ECB will just continue reacting to the inflationary data more than the output one. Um, Zoe, what's your take on this? Again, I know investors are fleeing into the safety of bonds and they're selling stocks, but this is kind of what the ECB wanted, right? They need to slow down the economy enough to get down inflation, otherwise they can't do it. Yes, but as just was said, the issue is here that the slowdown is not working on, on services inflation. And that is something that will give the ECB reason to be concerned. Obviously, you're going to Sintra next week and you'll be speaking to probably everyone on the governing council. And what I'm expecting them to say is, yes, July is happening. But then the question really very much is September. My guess would be that they will be quite hesitant, except for those quite pronounced talks, that they, most of them probably will say, it's just too early to commit to September. We've got several inflation prints. Sintra actually next week is um, timed not ideally because you've got three days in Sintra and then on Friday, you don't get the inflation print for June until the Friday. And then you'll also, so they'll have, um, they won't just have, uh, that will help determine the July um, move. But then before September, they'll have another two prints of inflation. They also will have new forecasts for September. So all that are things that will probably make um, a lot of the central bankers say, September, we just can't say at this point. And let's, again, committing now, you do have to be quite a pronounced talk to commit that far in advance. Yes, it's very difficult at the moment actually to have a clear picture of what happens. I mean, when you look at services inflation, does it come down? I mean, is there, you know, I know this is a surprise, but if you look at how inflation came up, is it not just going down in the same manner? So you see some of the manufacturing or inflation we're seeing in manufacturing first and then services comes later. Thomas. So I think that depends on the survey. We're just inferring from the PMI survey this morning. But the European Commission survey actually suggests that service inflation may stay elevated for a little bit longer. So I think it's very highly uncertain at this point in the cycle when we see this sur the survey services inflation transmit into the actual data and the ECB will react to the actual data. It is entirely possible that the next two services prints in the euro area surprise markets a bit to the downside. But equally, it's, 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 it could happen that they are persistent yeah. or go even higher. It's hugely uncertain right now. Yeah. That's why the ECB isn't willing to commit. However, what we do know is that they will put emphasis on the actual price inflation data more than anything yeah. else in the September decision. Yeah. Uh, and Zoe, I understand that, of course, we're in different cycles compared to the U.S., but one piece that really caught my attention this week was John Authors saying, look, the, the great inflation scare reaches its final phase, and he's, of course, talking about the U.S. and inflation in the U.S. appearing in the last lap. Like, talk to us about, I, I guess, how reliant U.S. inflation or how markets are interpreting U.S. inflation and how that relates to inflation in Europe. There always is the issue here of the gravitational pull of the Fed, that um, the ECB can very well say we've got our own inflation to watch, but in a way, what the Fed does, it does influence them quite massively. So the ECB hiking much longer than the Fed would be very unusual and would be one of those things that could, they could, though, be in a way forced to do this if inflation now stays too strong. Overall, going completely different to what the Fed does when the Fed has stopped or maybe already is thinking about cutting will be something that would be a, fir would be a premier from the ECB if they actually manage to go their own way on that.
Yeah, and Thomas, do, do ECB officials get influenced at all by what happens at, in the Bank of England? I guess th this is not the first central bank, right, in the last two weeks to surprise to the upside in terms of hikes. So does it change the narrative, not only looking at these figures, but just looking around you, whatever the other major central bank is doing? So I would say that the inflation problem facing the Bank of England is unique to the UK because they have a much, much tighter labor market than in the euro area. No. Most of it is with structural issues. So I would expect inflation here to be much, much more persistent than in the euro area. And hence, the Bank of England is now reacting to these data as well. So I think we need to be aware of this important difference. Yeah. Having said that, central bankers, of course, do talk to each other. There are panelists at Sintra next week from the Bank of England. So there's always some cross sort of spillovers, cross contamination in terms of thinking about inflation. All right. Uh, thank you both for joining us so much. Villa Dijk, their uh, chief European economist at T.R. Rowe Price and Bloomberg's Zoe Schneeweiss. Now, coming up, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen sees a lower recession risk as U.S. jobless claims climb to the highest level in nearly two years. So we'll get into that next. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, U.S. jobless claims figures climbed to the highest level since October 2021, suggesting that the labor market may be cooling somewhat. Meanwhile, Treasury Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, is sounding more optimistic about the chances of the U.S. avoiding a recession. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Jill Dices in Hong Kong. So, Jill, good morning. Why is Janet Yellen so optimistic or more optimistic? Right. Well, um, yeah, let's take a look at those comments from Yellen. So she was speaking to us and saying that essentially she sees the risk, if anything, of a recession going down. And I'm sure she's looking at, um, you know, actually some some pretty promising data that's come out uh, fairly recently out of the U.S. Uh, we saw um, some home uh, home construction data earlier this week that was pretty strong, suggesting that that's going to contribute positively to GDP growth uh, in the second quarter. Uh, we also got some pretty good retail sales data pretty uh, regularly. But um, it's also these these comments are pretty interestingly timed because she also just said that the, the labor market has been resilient. Um, and uh, at the same time, we have this new jobless, uh, these jobless claims data that suggests that uh, jobless claims are re uh, remaining quite elevated. Um, I do want to say, you know, um, Bloomberg, Bloomberg Economics took a look at some of this uh, and said, yes, like, you know, some of that uh, data is um, some of those jobless claims are really concentrated in just a few states. Um, and ultimately, even though they see the um, labor market is cooling off, uh, they've described it as kind of a gradual cooling this year. So um, and, and I will also point out that Bloomberg Economics has um, pushed back uh, their, their expectations for a recession a little bit, seeing something maybe hitting in the, 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 the back end of this year. Um, but I think what all of this is really telling us is that, um, you know, this is a very sort of tricky situation. Um, you know, we've seen uh, with Jay Powell, um, you know, just talking to lawmakers this week, and even what he said in the FOMC presser last week, um, that, you know, what the Fed's doing to target inflation, how it's balancing that against the economy and, you know, whatever the economy's resilience may be, um, that's all a very sort of flexible situation. And I think that that's really... Uh, you know, important to keep in mind here as we get these kind of new comments from Yellen about the state of the economy as we look at all of this data is that ultimately mm -hmm. um, it's just going to be a very interesting year ahead as we um, sort of plot out how exactly, um, you know, this, the, the economic outlook uh, works here. So, Jill, walk us through the new capital requirements also for banks that Jay Powell discussed on Capitol Hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look, um, this is um, so, so, you know, he was talking to lawmakers yesterday and this is sort of a long standing um, program that we've been talking about since the, uh, you know, 2009 financial crisis. Right. Um, is sort of addressing um, lending with some of these big banks. Um, I think that this really kicked up in earnest earlier this year when we saw some of these banking failures. And I think that's put a lot of scrutiny on here. Uh, so what Powell was ultimately saying is um, that he, he did shed a little bit of light here, saying that uh, the largest lenders on Wall Street probably um, would uh, could face an increase of about 20 percent in what they have to set aside. He did make the point of saying that would likely apply to the, you know, the eight biggest banks uh, rather than, um, you know, some smaller banks. But it's important to also remember that there's a lot of details that would still need to be worked out with any kind of a plan. Um, so it was really interesting hearing that from Powell. But ultimately, I think we're still going to need some details on how exactly that program would uh, come together before uh, we move forward.
All right, Jill, thanks so much. As always, Bloomberg's Jill Dice is there in Hong Kong. Now, shares in Siemens Energy have plunged after it scrapped its profit guidance due to mounting issues at the Spanish wind turbine unit. It's the latest in a long line of costly problems uncovered at Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's J.P. Barnett in Frankfurt. So, J.P., what do we actually know about what they found out? Well, the thing is that we know very little. The company only told us uh, that they did a deep technical review and that they discovered that it will take longer and cost more to fix those quality issues. But they didn't give us a timeline, they didn't give us an amount, or they didn't give us much details to work with. And that's why we see shares plunging here by about 30%. Because what can investors do if you give them uncertainty? Nothing but sell the stock. So, JP, when do we find out what happens next? If you look at the stock, so it's down some 28% as we speak. They withdrew this outlook because they basically had a review of some of their installed fleet and, you know, think that some of the quality issue means that they'll have to pay in excess of 1 billion euros. Could it be even higher than that? Do we find out in three days, in a month? Like, what, what exactly is going on? Yeah, I, I would love to know that, and I hope that the the the, 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 um, the decline in the stock price uh, is now a warning shot for for the management that they give us more uh, more details. I mean, like. You can't just like announce that you're restoring your your profit guidance and then give investors nothing to work with. I mean, you you have to come out now in the next uh, couple of days, uh, a week or two, the latest, uh, and give some idea like, okay, this is our game plan. Uh, we expect this and that. I mean, they, they stick to their revenue guidance. I mean, that's some good news here, at least from from the company. Uh, but this this bad junk of information that they have put out now into Nirvana, um, they have to put some boundaries around it and, and tell investors what's going on. And they rather do this sooner than later. I would I would hope for. Okay, JP, thanks so much. JP Barnett there in Frankfurt. Coming up, the World Bank is pushing for more private sector investments in emerging markets. We'll explain the new initiative next, and this is Bloomberg. China could do more to make itself understood, but on the other side, I would like to say the outsider should also work hard to understand China. You know, it's it's uh, uh, it's very much interesting. Ever since the China opens up, China Chinese people have tried very hard to understand outside world. The same kind of response, you know, could also be needed. Well, that was the AIIB president, uh, President Jin, speaking to us exclusively at the summit for a new financial pact in Paris. Uh, we also spoke to the World Bank Group president, Ajay Banga, and Mark Carney, co-chair of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, on the initiative to get more private sector investments to emerging markets. This is an exciting uh, partnership, basically the World Bank focusing on much more private investments or, or private money. Tell us about it. So basically, if you look at the challenges ahead of us, there's lots of intertwining crises. There's you know, the challenge of poverty, of course, but then there's a the whole issue of livable planet, which includes climate and fragility and pandemics and food security and an unnecessary war in Ukraine. When you put all that together, there's no way that there's adequate money in the governments or philanthropy or the multilateral banks. You have to bring in the ingenuity and the capital and the technology of the private sector. That's what we're trying to harness, but doing it in a way that brings people who know the private sector, understand its risks and management, and those people come to help us do things better. How fast and with what kind of money? Uh, what kind of money? Uh, well, real money. Uh, and how much money? The various estimates. But if you look at external financing, the increase in external financing into non-China emerging and developing world, it's something on the order of an extra trillion dollars a year, certainly by the end of this decade. So we need to ramp, rapidly scale it up. But we also need to generate a lot more domestic finance as well. So it's about domestic reform as much as international. Is this enough to make a real difference? So first of all, what are the chances of this you know, being locked up or locked out fast and does it go to the projects that need to be well the idea to? here is that I believe that if you take renewable energy I do believe that now the cost per unit of renewable energy is below that of fossil fuel the question is therefore why is it that the private sector would not want to invest in those in the emerging markets part of it might be capital going to the developed world but part of it might be the risks they see macro FX, other such things, yeah. securitizable vehicles. There's a whole series of things that we think this group can help us learn from, and then we can do things together. 
So why has that not been happening happening naturally? Well, let's 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 go back two years ago. Uh, two years ago, only a third of global emissions were covered by country net zero commitments. Now it's well over ninety percent. Uh, two years ago was uh, you know a thousand fifteen hundred companies had net zero commitments at science based targets. Now it's ten thousand, and on and on and on. So the world is now moving very rapidly. But what that exposes is that it has to be all the world. It has to be all the emerging markets and very much the developing countries, and it has to happen in a way that's going to yield growth and poverty reduction alongside climate transition. Our economies are pretty fragile. Does that complicate things, actually moving capital? Uh, I th well, look, actually, I think I have maybe a different view of uh, the relative strengths in the economy. My view is that we are on the cusp of an investment boom in the adva advanced economies across much of the emerging world, and the issue is to make sure that that happens everywhere. And this is what we're working on. Well, the World Bank President Ajay Banga and our co-chair of Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, Mark Kern, speaking to us from the summit, New Global Financing Pact in Paris. Now, that summit, of course, is still going on in Paris with Secretary Yellen just speaking. She did speak and catch up with some of our reporters on the ground talking about recession in the U.S. Economic activity in the euro area almost came to a halt in June with dismal PMI data from Germany and France. U.S. jobless claims climbed to the highest level in nearly two years, suggesting a cooling job market. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen sees the risk of a U.S. recession diminishing. Plus, shares in Siemens Energy plunge after it took back its profit guidance due to mounting issues at the Spanish wind turbine unit. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. So we're getting some euro area overall PMI figures. Again, the big question is, what do all of these mean for the ECB? We'll also be in Sintra live next week, where uh, all of the ECB Governing Council members will speak about exactly, well, what the way forward is for a lot of these. So your area, June manufacturing, PMI coming in at 43.6, the forecast was 44.8, and then we have UK PMI also extremely interesting, although some of the PMI figures are a little bit backward looking. And of course, the Bank of England has uh, troubles on their own because of mortgage rates and the fact that the market is now pricing in a 6% interest rate um, for the end of the year. All right, UK June services PMI falling to 53.7. That's below estimates, manufacturing PMI pretty much as expected. When you look at inflation, when you look at some of the eco data, again, there's this poll and put between services and manufacturing and it's unclear what that means for inflation having to go down going forward. Now on to tech and Twitter needs to increase its resources if it wants to comply with new European regulations ahead of a deadline in August. That's according to Thierry Breton, the bloc's internal market commissioner. Now he says there are a few critical areas that Elon Musk's social media platform needs to focus on immediately. He made very clear that he, he, will, uh, he will comply with our regulation and that uh, he believes that uh, DSA is a good regulation and this is what he wants to do. So um, uh, again, uh, I proposed to all of them, including Twitter, to, um, to run a stress test in their headquarters to make sure that they will uh, understand what they have to do to be ready. He accepted. He's the first one, by the way. To, um, to accept it, which is, uh, of course, a good sign. Well, that was uh, Thierry Breton, the EU Commissioner for Internal Markets, uh, of course, uh, talking about Twitter needing to comply with the Digital Services Act. Now, Ukraine's Prime Minister, Denis Schmiel, told our Maria Tadeo in an exclusive conversation it's too early to make an assessment on the Ukrainian counteroffenses while playing down concerns that future funding actually depends on this military success on the battlefield against Russia. This is a conversation he had with our European correspondent, Maria. Messages from partners are very supportive, are very promising, and now we continue our counteroffensive. This is not easy walk. This is not Hollywood movie, as our president, Volodymyr Zelensky, said. And uh, counteroffensive, it's multiple operations. Mm -hmm. It's offensive, it's defensive operations, it's uh, tactical pauses, so it will take time. Well, Maria joins us now. So, Maria, it was a great interview. It was an extensive interview. And, of course, he was in London for this reconstruction 
um, package, he, he says that funding is not pegged to military success. And it's such a difficult question, Francine, because on the one hand, they really try to talk about the economy and rebuilding Ukraine, and yet we talk about the war and we know the counteroffensive is going on and this is a brutal war. I mean, he said it himself. This is, it is critical and, and it's a tough war. It's not going to be a Hollywood movie. I asked him three times, however, do you feel there is a connection between the money and the success on the battlefield? Will the money decrease if you don't do well on the battlefield? He told me three times, no. And I asked in every possible way that I could. He really tried to shut down that conversation. But do they feel pressure? They do. They know that allies want to see gains on the battlefield. They know there's an election happening in the United States next year. The United States has pumped billions into this war, so they do feel it has to go well. But again, the war, it's unpredictable. It's tough. So how's the counteroffensive actually going for Ukraine? Yeah, and I asked him that question, and he told me it has been going on now for two weeks. There was a secrecy as to whether it's a fully on now. He did tell me a counteroffensive. It's, it's not a Hollywood movie again. It's a number of different operations. It's defensive. It's offensive, too. He did say perhaps some expected that this was going to be fast. Obviously, now there's an understanding that they did not make the quick gains that some were hoping for. But he also said, we're not going to do what Russia is doing, just throw money and, and people and do a massacre. We can't do that. We're not going to fight it Soviet style. And they still say we're not done yet. We continue and hopefully it's successful for them. Maria, thank you so much. Our Bloomberg Europe correspondent there at Maria today with the very latest, of course, on this important conversation she had with the Prime Minister of Ukraine. Coming up, we'll discuss how poorer countries are facing the greatest threats from climate change. We'll bring you more from our exclusive interview with the French Finance Minister. That's next. And this is Bloomberg. Wants the poorest countries in the world to be confronted to a choice between fighting against extreme poverty and fighting against climate change. We want to provide all the financial means for those countries to be efficient in the fight against poverty and in the fight against climate change. This is the key purpose of this summit and I think that the key point, the key purpose would be to define a new financial architecture for the 21st century. Minister, are you frustrated that it's taking this much time? I know the Chinese Premier is here, which is a great coup because we haven't actually seen US officials and Chinese officials at this high level in a room together talking about these, the, these issues, but you've tried to push also voting rights in the IMF. How's that going? Big things need a long time, so I'm not frustrated. I think that we are totally, totally determined with President Macron to have a final positive outcome for this summit. Uh, I think that we are moving in the right direction as far as uh, debt restructuring is concerned. We want to move faster, we want to move quicker. Uh, I think that we could have a positive outcome as far as the debt of Zambia and Sri Lanka is concerned. It is really quite good news to have the Chinese Prime Minister here in Paris today talking with all the head of states, talking with the Secretary Janet Yellen. This is really, I think, a very positive outcome. We also have the new president of the World Bank and we are defining a new role for the multilateral development banks, providing more money for the poorest countries. So really things are moving on the right direction and the final outcome must be positive. Uh, Minister, I imagine that in the corridors they talk about trade, they talk about the fact that Secretary Blinken was in China, the fact that uh, we have President Xi with a rapprochement with the US. What does this mean for global growth? I think it's good news because um, we all want to improve the relationship between the three uh, continents, between China, the US, Europe. Uh, we are totally determined to defend our own economic interests in Europe. You know that the new principle, which is now at the core of the European future, has been defined by President Macron, and it is sovereignty. Sovereignty means that we want to defend our uh, technological assets, our economic interests, while talking with China, but being aware that there is a necessity to uh, really have all the necessary tools to defend our economic interests. But 
A French finance minister Bruno Le Maire there speaking at the summit for a new global financing pact in Paris yesterday. Now also at the summit, Kenya's president who told me that the country plans to repurchase at least half of its $2 billion euro bond that's maturing in June 2024 before the end of the year. Now President William Ruto also issued a warning to speculators. The people who are looking for how to make a kill from this, they think they can scare us and uh, you know create a, a, a narrative around it. I want to promise them that we are going to redeem half of it before the end of the of this year, and we will square it out by the time uh, time lapses in June next year. We are in a good space. Well, that was the Kenyan President William Ruto speaking to Bloomberg. Meanwhile, Zambia has reached an agreement in principle to restructure $6.3 billion of debt with bilateral lenders. It sets a precedence for a growing list of countries struggling to service their liabilities. While on Twitter, Zambian President Haikande Hishilema called the agreement a significant milestone. Joining us now from the summit in Paris is also Rajiv Shah, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Rajiv, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Or I should call you Dr. Shah. You've been a leader on all of these issues for quite some time. Are you confident that this will lead to something more concrete? I know Emmanuel Macron has done a great job in bringing people together on keeping the momentum going, but now it needs to be a transfer of money if we're going to get real stuff done. Well, thank you for having me. Look, this Paris summit is extraordinarily important because it is an admission by world leaders that we are failing to fight climate change around the world in a way where we're providing funding to allow dozens of economies to transition their economies to a better climate future. And if we continue to fail, we'll see what we've seen in the last few years. More poverty, more people that live without access to electricity, more coal-fired generation being financed and brought online, and greater threats to all of us that our world will be uninhabitable. So I applaud President Macron for bringing folks together. I applaud the 30-plus world leaders who have come to Paris. And yeah, I do think there are some specific outcomes uh, related to specific pieces of progress that are important and a good first step. Unfortunately, it's not quite enough, and so this will have to continue well beyond just the two days in Paris this week. So what are you expecting concretely by here until the end of the year? And Dr. Shah, I know the, the conference very well. I was there yesterday, so we're looking at world leaders, and you're literally like five meters away from them. Do you see a resolve from these world leaders to also transfer funds, or is it only talk? Well, uh, there have been, I do expect a few specific outcomes that will be a, an important step on funding. So 14 years ago, the world leaders committed to provide $100 billion to help countries around the planet fight climate change. For 14 years, they have not met that commitment. I think thanks to this summit, this year it'll be the first time they do actually meet that commitment. We've seen uh, prior commitments on some technical issues called special drawing rights. I think more countries will donate special drawing rights to allow for very poor countries to invest in fighting climate change and protecting their people. We've seen progress on things called loss and damage waivers, so then when loans are provided to countries to pay for their infrastructure, if they're swamped and overwhelmed by extreme climate events that are just devastating, they get a break in having to pay back those loans until they can recover and then, and then they can pick up their repayment. These are incremental improvements. They are not enough, but they are the output of a lot of political leadership uh, offered by the French President Macron and others, uh, Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados most notably. And I think they're a good first step towards real transformation. A first step is only a first step. Where do you think we'll be in two and three years? And again, given all of the political pressures, economic pressures, inflation, cost of living, do you think, Dr. Shah, that we're taking a step back in trying to find solutions for these important things that we need to deal with? Yeah. Well, you know, I think, frankly, given the rise of populist politics all around the world, if we didn't have these types of summits, 
we would be continuing to step back from our commitments to especially the world's most vulnerable people. You know, the impacts of climate change are far worse if you're in the Horn of Africa and you're suffering from hunger and malnutrition. They're far worse if you live in coastal Bangladesh and you're dealing with rising sea levels. They are far worse if you're a climate migrant from the Northern Triangle region of, of Central America trying to make your way to the American southern border. So these are problems we can solve with the right strategies and the right investments. To your question about what should we seek two to three years from now, uh, what we should really seek is new public-private partnerships that provide trillions of dollars of investment so that everyone can participate, not just in the crisis, but in the opportunity. You know, renewable energy is a huge investment opportunity in wealthier economies. It's not yet a, a lucrative investment opportunity in lower income economies. We need to change that. Battery storage should be available to economies all over the planet, not just in China, Europe, and the United States. We should have electric vehicles and electric buses, and the jobs that are created by manufacturing them should help lift up people and communities. Everyone should get to participate in the upside of the climate transition. And what I'd like to see is what the Rockefeller Foundation is focusing on, is getting more private investment and public-private partnerships so there can be thousands of development projects that are about renewable energy. They can create millions of jobs, and they can lift up those people who have otherwise been left out of a, and not given a fair shot at growth and opportunity. Um, Dr. Shaw, what needs to happen from finance? And we saw this private-public partnership, certainly the World Bank under the helm of the new president trying to spearhead a little bit of movement on that front. But has finance played a fair role in this? Well, uh, so far it hasn't actually played enough of a role. I mean, if you look right now, uh, developing countries in particular represent a very significant credit and foreign exchange currency risk for investors. So what I would urge uh, the new World Bank president, Ajay Banga, and Mark Carney, who is helping him uh, address the challenges of private finance, is to learn from things that are working. The Rockefeller Foundation, the Bezos Earth Fund, and the IKEA Foundation created the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. We've mobilized $11 billion and have launched more than 30 projects in more than 16 countries in just 18 months. That's working because it represents real blended finance, private and public together, to do things that make sense for everybody. Build out solar parks so that you can provide electricity, but also create jobs with local manufacturing of solar panels build out uh, battery storage on grids in India and Africa and Latin America so countries can take more renewable intermittent energy in a cost-efficient way. These are the solutions of the future and frankly those that now lead these institutions that were created after World War II to reconstruct Western Europe have a tough but critical task of modernizing those institutions so they can be more public-private and more technology-oriented as they look to the future. But is, so what's the secret sauce in making this work? Is it templates for infrastructure building that then needs to be replicated? I keep on being told that actually finance is interested because the returns are there. Has it not been proven or is capital going elsewhere? No, I think the secret sauce is blended finance. So, so you have private financial uh, investors that will seek a certain return. And then you have philanthropies like the Rockefeller Foundation that actually don't need a high return. We want to see the projects happen and we want to see jobs created and we want to see our climate protected for our children's future. It's bringing together and convening and partnering across those different types of partners as opposed to just trying to do everything yourself as a public financier like the World Bank or as a private financial institution like a, a global private equity fund. Uh, doing this alone is never going to work. The secret sauce is building unlikely partnerships around concrete and specific projects that have the potential to lift up people and have the potential to save our planet from a disastrous climate future. And, you know, we have a few dozen projects that we're doing that at scale already, so we know how to get that done. It's just we need world leaders to come to Paris and force these big institutions to, to, you know, snap out of their way of working and to embrace a much more public-private partnership orientation into the future.
All right, Rajiv Shah, thank you so much for joining us, president there of the Rockefeller Foundation. Coming up, we'll look at the culture of sexism in the city of London following Chris Pinodi's ousting from his firm. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Fundamentally, we are better when we are not having to navigate our fear of being found out at work, when we have to worry about which pronouns we talk about our other halves in, when we think about our holiday destinations and what you're doing every weekend in June. I don't know, but, but the point being, <laughs> um, I'm reading a book, by the way. Anyway, that, that stuff is unhelpful for you. And when you are, when you rip off those shackles, when you, when you don't have to worry about those things, you are 100% delivering. That is Man Group's incoming Chief Executive Officer Robin Bruce speaking at the Bloomberg Power of Action event in London yesterday. Now, in the wake of Chris Minotti's ousting from his firm, we're doing a deeper dive into the culture of sexism in the city of London. Companies have set up mandatory harassment courses, whistleblowing hotlines, and tried to diversify, but women say that does not go far enough. Bloomberg's Catherine Griffiths joins us now with the very latest. Um, this is, frankly, a sad story that we shouldn't be writing, Catherine, but you've done a great job in, in trying to bring to light some of these really shocking cases and what it means about the wider city of London. Like, where are we? If you look at Chris Odie, what's been happening to Odie, is this symptomatic of a wider problem? So I think perhaps the Odie situation is is a fairly extreme one. Yeah. Of course, Chris Benodi disputes a lot of the things that have been said about him. But um, I think people might be of the view that um, there might be something particular about someone who is the founder of a business, such a, a powerful character. The business is housed in a Mayfair townhouse, which is a, a, small, a small place. Um, when you compare that to sort of big institutions where there are lots more sort of rules and processes that have been put in place, there may well be some differences. Um, but yes, what our reporting shows is that women do feel across the board that there's an awful lot of things that are still going on which they're not happy about and they don't feel very confident or optimistic that they could do much about it. What's holding back change? So is it people at the top? Is it, I mean, We went through the Me Too movement, which is that more surprising that we're still seeing cases in the city of London. Yes. Um, so I think it's a few things that are holding back change. There are things that we know about, like non-disclosure agreements that have been used so much to kind of keep people quiet. There is some sense in which perhaps those are being reduced because actually regulators are sort of pushing back against their improper use. There's the fact that firms and the regulator has whistleblowing processes but people just really don't feel particularly confident about those there's the fact that the stats on prosecutions are, are low although no one of course wants to be in a situation where they're having to bring something like that but i think more than anything it's just people around wrongdoers allowing them to carry on for a long time and that can be because it's awkward to do something about it um, it can be because it's sort of hard to absolutely establish the facts or it can be because perhaps one's own self-interest is seen to be allowing them to carry on, whether it's continuing to make profits, continuing to have sort of mutually beneficial, powerful relationships. That's what we see so often. Catherine, thank you so much. Catherine Griffiths there with some very powerful reporting uh, together with uh, Lukia and Jonathan. We'll push it out, of course, on social media. It's basically entitled Odie's Downfall. It shows how far women have to go in the city of London. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Pretty group does in New York. Our Danny Berger is here in London. And this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Global stocks set for their biggest weekly loss since March. Investors stay risk-averse after a string of central bank rate hikes. The latest PMI data adds fuel to those slowdown concerns. Eurozone activity nears contraction, while UK numbers also disappoint. U.S. data are due later today. 
And President, Pro uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Modi announced a series of deals to improve military and economic ties between the U.S. and India. The two leaders are also scheduled to meet with corporate executives to discuss tech innovation. Happy Friday. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Man, Kriti, that Europe data really adding some fuel to the risk off fire this morning. Yeah, and something that's translating straight to the U.S. session as well, Danny. I want to quickly get into futures here because you are seeing that risk off sentiment that we've kind of seen all week accelerate on Friday. Perhaps a little bit of cashing out ahead of the long weekend. The futures at 44.01 here, down about five tenths of one percent. But take a look at the two year yield, 476. That's that PMI action that you were talking about. Yield dropping about three basis points. You're already seeing a little bit of a move there. To me, what's interesting is the Bloomberg dollar index. And I should add really quickly before I go there, the 10-year yield moving six basis points. So seeing a much bigger move on uh, further out into the curve. The dollar following that story, though, because even though uh, it is stronger by five-tenths of one percent, the biggest kind of tailwind for the dollar this morning is the euro. So very sensitive, again, to the economic data that we're getting. NYMEX crude, always important as we talk about those recessionary warnings. Danny, a 68 handle on the commodity there. Yeah, everything that is high beta is selling off really viciously this morning. The one weird thing I will say, Kriti, European stocks are somehow up. Um, we're up, you know, six hundredths of a percent, sure. And what's getting us there are defensive. So it's not necessarily the good type of gains you'd want to see in European stocks. The euro is getting clobbered. This is a really, really painful session for European FX. It is down nearly 1% versus the dollar. We are solidly under 109 this morning. Again, it is that eurozone PMIs. Valerie Titel is going to talk to us about them in just a moment. So I won't go into a ton of details. But look, you can see based on what the belly of the curve is doing in Germany, the fact that this is where we're buying really does signify that, okay, maybe it's not going to be higher for long. Longer. Maybe the ECB can't be as hawkish as some of them say they want to be and continuing to hike into September. And again, Kriti, just that point that it's anything high beta and anything commodities linked, anything growth link that's really getting slammed. Look at the Naki. It's down nearly 2% versus the dollar. Remember, this is the central bank that surprised doing 50 basis points yesterday. Not only did it undo all those moves yesterday, all the strengthening, but now it is decisively weaker this morning, Kriti. Yeah, a, a massive move, of course, in the FX space. But I got to say, the yield space as well, when you talk about the action stateside, that's really crucial. Of course, you know, in the last 24 hours or so, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen sounding a little bit more optimistic about the chances of the U.S. avoiding a recession. That is good news. But then on the other hand, you have that PMI data out of Europe painting a little bit of a gloomier picture. To break it all down, Bloomberg's Valerie Tallytell joins us with the numbers. Valerie, what do we need to know here? Oh boy, Kriti, services PMIs disappointed across the board. And remember, this is pivotal because services PMI was like the last bastion of growth here in Europe as manufacturing uh, has been weakening for a while. Services held up very well, but cracks in that narrative started showing today. It kicked off with France falling into contraction and then followed with the German numbers also disappointing. And then the Euro area services PMI also disappointing. This is very much aggregating fears of a hard landing here in Europe and this rebound out of this mild winter recession is now very much questioned. Uh, Euro sank on this news almost 1% and now the market is getting skeptical if the ECB in fact needs to do those two more hikes to get to 4% by September. We also had the UK PMIs. They weren't as disappointing but still disappointing nonetheless. Uh, services also contracting or sorry also falling uh, versus consensus still in expansionary territory. Uh, manufacturing was slightly weak as well. Man, I mean, the recession and vibes are, are very vibey in Europe. But in the U.S., we have Janet Yellen saying uh, we're not going to get a recession. Are things that different in the U.S. than Europe right now? Things are still looking more rosy in the U.S., really pu putting so much pressure on the fact that it's the U.S. economy who still seems to see be the bright light holding up well to all these interest rate hikes. We do get the services PMI uh, and the manufacturing PMI later uh, this morning. Uh, both expected to, to fall slightly uh, versus last month's print, but not as much. And we're still nowhere near contraction territory when it comes to the services PMI in Europe. Uh, it's expected to come at 54. 
Valerie, thank you very much. That is Bloomberg's Valerie Titel. Now, elsewhere in the U.S., moves from regulators to raise capital requirements for lenders will fall largely at the feet of Wall Street's biggest banks. Fed Chair Jerome Powell told the Senate Banking Com Committee lenders that lenders rather could face an increase of around 20 percent in what they have, are, have to set aside. The, the capital requirements will be very, very skewed to the eight largest banks, the GSIBs. There may be some capital increases for the other banks, and there won't. I don't, I'm not. I think none of this should affect banks under 100 billion. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf on this. Tom, when could these changes take effect? Yeah, I mean, look, they're looking to come through these Basel III changes at the start of 2025. So there's a fair bit of time for the banks to sort of obviously prepare for them, as is always the case here. But you know, the size of this increase. 20% is absolutely massive, obviously. And, and you've already had a few of those big bank CEOs like Jane Fraser of Citigroup saying this will be a you know, huge change. And, you know, is, is it the right sort of quantum? Tom, talk to us a little bit about the city story here. We're getting a lot of different kind of headlines. And you just referenced it yourself. Walk us through what we need to know on city. Yeah, well, so as well as obviously, you know, City being one of the banks to be affected by uh, big capital requirements, we, we had a great scoop out yesterday about how that bank has taken you know, more steps to try and encourage uh, return to the office. So traditionally, you know, last few years, it's been a little bit more lenient than some of the other Wall Street banks. But now we understand, you know, they're starting to really track their employees' sort of attendance and um, look into kind of, you know, have those conversations, you know, between managers and direct reports in terms of you really need to start um, coming back in or there will be more consequences. Yeah, a lot to digest from the Wall Street world. We're going from Wall Street uh, to geopolitics in just a moment. Tom Metcalf, thank you as always for breaking that down. A crucial story again as we talk about the read through into what we're going to hear in Washington, which brings us, by the way, to the geopolitics. Prime Minister Modi had his first visit to the United States yesterday where he and President Biden announced a series of defense and commercial deals designed to improve military and economic ties between their nations. With this visit, Indian firms are announcing more than $2 billion, more than $2 billion in new investments in manufacturing, solar in, in Colorado, steel in Ohio, and optic fiber in South Carolina, and much more. Further proof that America's manufacturing is back. We bring in Bloomberg's Roz Matheson for a little bit more of a breakdown. Roz, 24 hours ago, we had uh, Prime Minister Modi really already talking to a lot of the tech CEOs. How does that materialize? Where do we go from here? Well, certainly we have seen him come on this visit and scoop up a bunch of deals, really, for Indian companies, both in the defense space and the tech space. So we've got deals for big companies to do jet engines, to do drones, and also in the tech space, with potentially more to come. We've got Elon Musk looking around to invest in India. We've got that potential $1 billion micron investment in India, and that's really as India's trying to set itself up as a place to do business in the tech space, an alternative, of course, to China and elsewhere in Europe. So really, a lot of deals on the plate. We can see he met at that dinner last night a bunch of big CEOs from big tech companies in the US, Af Apple, Alpha, Alphabet, Microsoft, they were all there last night. He's meeting further with further business leaders today before he leaves the U.S., so possibly some more deals to come. But certainly we can see the effort there to sort of do a lot more business between the U.S. and India, and it's got that strategic element too, of course, of drawing India closer to the U.S. and further away from China and Russia. Roz, now elsewhere uh, in D.C., Biden was under some heat about comments he made about she using the word dictator. Uh, let's just take a quick listen to some of what he had to say about that. We had an incident that uh, caused uh, some uh, some confusion, you might say. But President, but the Secretary Blinken had a great trip to China. I expect to be meeting with President Xi sometime in the future, in the near term, and. Uh, I don't think it's had any real consequence. So Biden there saying he doesn't think it's had any consequences. Uh, how would we know if it has? Are there any signs? 
Well, there are several things to look for, but obviously the U.S. is trying to send a signal that perhaps the U.S. president, this is an off-the-cuff remark, this was not meant to be made at the time, move beyond that and back to the idea that they're trying to reset ties more broadly, look at the visit from Blinken and so on, and so a real effort to sort of say, let's not have this become a true problem, um, despite the China anger over it. There are several things to look for. We have the Chinese Premier in Paris. Uh, he may meet today briefly with the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, a handshake even and something would be a signal and possibly looking at a visit to the US pretty soon from the Chinese foreign minister and that would be another sign that at least these level of, of meetings and activities are going on all trying to build towards that meeting between the two presidents later this year. Okay, Roz, thank you so much for that. That is Bloomberg's Roz Matheson. Now coming up on the program, we're going to be speaking to Sushil Wadwani, PJ Wadwani CIO and former Bank of England MPC member. Plenty to discuss there. And plenty to discuss in the world of stocks. We're going to be speaking as well to Neil Brown, head of equities at GIB Asset Management. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Look, we are wrapping up a pretty tumultuous week when it comes to the S&P 500. We've seen a lot of rate hikes around the world, then coupled with a little bit of economic data and commentary from government officials. It's the same issues, inflation, recession. But this time, perhaps the S&P 500 taking a little bit of a breather. For radio audience, stick with me. For our TV audience, we are looking at a chart here, just putting those percentage gains or losses into a little bit of perspective. This week saw so much red on the screen that it is actually the worst week going all the way back to the week of March 10th. And that is significant because that week, I'm sure you guys all have it marked in your calendar, was when we all saw that massive banking turmoil, the risk off idea that liquidity was an issue, that the banking system uh, and broadly the markets were going to take a bigger tumble. Of course, we know that in the following weeks, as that situation cleared up, we did see a little bit of buy in. But since then, uh, this kind of makes sense. Seeing a little bit of a pullback after about five weeks of gains. Let's bring in a little bit more markets analysis here. Phil Serafino, our Bloomberg Markets editor, joins us from Paris, I believe. How much of this is just some sort of technical pullback, given we have seen a lot of green on the screen for the last month or so? Yeah, I mean, that's true. You might expect a little pullback, given how strong the market's been. But you also get a sense from talking to investors that the narrative is kind of shift, shifting this week. I mean, uh, up through last week, the sentiment had been, you know, everything was going to be just right. Uh, the Fed was going to engineer a soft landing. Uh, China's going to pick up because they're going to provide some stimulus and, and everything would be fine. We'd avoid a major recession. This week, there's been a lot of, a lot of rethinking of that narrative. You know, um, we saw more profit warnings from some chemical companies, which are a really good sort of uh, bellwether for the industrial economy. Lanxis, the big German company, put out a profit warning this week. I think that was the fifth one from a big European chemical company. So that sort of tells you um, there is some question about the strength of the economy. Um, and, you know, the Fed has continued to make hawkish noises. Powell is sending the message that, you know, uh, it does not seem like they're going to be cutting rates anytime soon. They have farther to go on the increases. And so you do get the sense that, that the narrative is shifting. And you can see it in the leadership in the market. You look what's not doing well this week. Biggest losers, real estate, energy, financials, basic materials. That's an economic indicator. Didn't home builders, though, Phil, just hit in a, a, a new high for the year, though, this week? I still feel like there's there's some confusing cross yeah. currents here. Absolutely. And that one, I think, has a lot of people scratching their heads. How can it be that the economy is heading into a recession if home builders are going to all time highs? I guess that's what makes market in markets interesting. You weigh that against the, the question of industrials not doing well. Um, you know, the, the message from the Fed, uh, commercial real estate just getting absolutely pounded. Uh, you know, here in Europe, we've got some major problems in places like the UK and Sweden. Um, so, yeah, cross currents, I guess, is the best way to put it. But uh, it's, it re really does make you wonder. Well, Phil, let's marry those two ideas then. Are you hearing any sort of optimism around saying, look, it's time now to hop into the cyclical trade again, or is this kind of a one-off? Um, you know, I have not heard anyone say that. I think, uh, as I was saying earlier about the chemicals, that is sort of a cyclical bell bellwether that tells you um, there is further downside to go. Uh, like I said, we've seen four or five big profit warnings. Um, so, you know, I think maybe the time you want to buy those is when things are at their absolute worst and, I, and in the economy, because that would be the bottom. And it feels like we haven't gotten there yet. 
I, I love that Bank of America just put out a, a new note about some of the rotation that tech funds have seen two billion dollars worth of outflow this week through Wednesday, saying that we're fleeing the baby bubble. Um, Phil, though, I got to wonder if we're heading towards a, a worse time for the economy. I mean, tech is a little bit less cyclical, no? So I feel like maybe we might see some folks go back to that. I mean, that's the eternal debate. When, when there's very little growth in the economy, some of these companies that have secular growth stories, like a lot of these tech companies, they should hold up okay. But um, again, there is, a, there is a pretty fierce debate about how, much those com how well those companies will hold up in a down economy and which ones within tech. There certainly will be some winners or losers. But for now, at least, I think investors are backing off a little bit, given the, the, the cross currents we were just talking about. Phil, as we speak, our, our producer Dan Curtis talking about how Apple closed at a record high yesterday. We're getting really close to that $3 trillion mark. One of my favorite fun facts about Apple stories, every time it hits the $1 trillion, the $2 trillion mark, not only does it have a massive sell-off, it takes the entire S&P 500 with it. I wonder, in terms of positioning, is the market, are equity investors positioned for some, side, some sort of bigger sell-off? I think if you saw a big sell-off in something like Apple, I mean, just because of the sheer size, that would drag the index down, and it would it would probably be a sentiment indicator for, especially for retail traders. You know, Apple is just a beloved stock uh, in the retail world and institutional as well. Um, that that would probably. Uh, would not be a good signal. But I also have to say, Apple is a marketing powerhouse and seems like one of those brands, at least from talking to investors, people think they would hold up relatively well in a, uh, in a down cycle. So that, that, that remains to be seen. But um, yeah, the three trillion um, milestone will be something to watch. So we can buy Apple, we can buy the dollar, maybe the two only safe places in this market right now. Phil, thank you so much for joining us after a tumultuous week. Bloomberg's Phil Serafino there. And for more market analysis, go to MLiveGo on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Now, let's go to some of the stories that caught our eye this morning and the one that everybody has been paying attention to all week. The U.S. Navy had already detected an implosion of the Titan submersible on Sunday. That's according to a senior Navy official. The information was shared immediately with the U.S. Coast Guard and search teams were dispatched to, quote, make every effort to save the lives on board. The Coast Guard announced Thursday that they believe the five passengers on board died from an implosion. All right, let's shift gears a little bit and now look at some of the corporate stories we've been tracking. Over in Europe, a big sell-off. Shares of Siemens Energy fell to a record low amid deepening concerns over its wind unit. The unit's Spanish division found worse than expected quality flaws at its wind turbine. Siemens withdrew its profit guidance, warning of additional costs exceeding $1 billion. Kriti, this specific unit, this wind turbine unit for Siemens, I got to say, it continues to be a headache for this company. I interview the CEO at Siemens Energy quite frequently. I'm pretty sure every single quarter over the past two years I've asked him about the wind turbines because it is an issue for them. Yeah, a turnaround plan that isn't necessarily working out for it. I have to say, though, it's kind of a little bit of deja vu, Danny, because it's a new issue, perhaps, but it's almost the same problem, the same thing we're talking about. It comes down to raw materials, to commodities, to the supply chain, the idea that the rising cost that you're seeing in things like steel, for example, still having a mm. really adverse effect on some of that production. No, it's absolutely true. I mean, you do have this kind of irony that it is this green shift. People want this type of energy. They want turbines, but that kind of exacerbates what you're talking about, right? A lot of demand, but not much supply. Okay, other demand supply dynamics, especially in labor. Ford, Critty, you flagged this story to me. They're planning a fresh round of layoffs for U.S. salaried workers. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. The job cuts are expected in the coming weeks in its gas engine business. 
Critty, I feel like you're trying to make me sad because not only did you flag this job story to me, you also flagged, what was it, FedEx earlier this week also cutting jobs? Well, it's interesting. I'm, I admittedly am a little obsessed with the labor market right now, finally getting on that train a year after everyone else hopped on it. But what's interesting to me is the way it's showing up in the stock market because even though from a kind of human perspective, it is sad, of course, to lose a job and, and it's very hard on families at the moment. From a stock market perspective, shares are often rewarded for it. We just saw the Ford shares higher mm. by 1.2% uh, on those headlines at least yesterday in the pre-market down about six tenths of 1%. What's important to keep in mind here is that if this was a tech company, you'd be seeing the share reaction in the opposite direction. But for a company like Ford, industrials, car makers, that doesn't seem to be mm. the issue. And especially when Ford is saying this is yet another layoff. They've announced several in just the last year. Are we finally going to start to see that show up in the macro data? We had initial jobless claims yesterday. They did surprise to the upside a new high of 264,000. The four-week average ticks higher, too. Perhaps we're starting to see some cooling in the labor market, Critty. Maybe this is finally coming and will help out Jay Powell and company. I mean, you would hope so, right? But then there's always those lags, right? You have the warn notices, mm. then you have the way it actually feeds into the data, then like the, the lag in terms of actually reporting the data, and then the market saying, oh, hey, look, there's a trend. So it'll still take some time for it to actually show up, but we're getting there. We're seeing them on a bigger scale now. Yep, something that uh, Powell mentioned in his congressional testimony. All right, coming up. We're going to be speaking to Sushil Wadwani. He is a former MPC member, advisor to Jeremy Hunt's Economic Advisory Council, and current hedge fund manager at PGM Wadwani. He is the CIO and founder. We're going to be speaking to him about the shocking BOE decision yesterday. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Global stocks set for their biggest weekly loss since March. Investors stay risk averse after a string of central bank rate hikes. The latest PMI data adds fuel to slow down concerns. Eurozone activity nears contraction, while numbers in the UK also disappoint. US data are also due later today. And President Biden and Prime Minister Modi announced a series of deals to improve military and economic ties between the United States and India. The two leaders are also scheduled to meet with corporate executives to discuss tech innovation. I'm Krita Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Danny, a lot to digest on the geopolitical front and the markets front, but I got to say mm. the bond market still taking the cake. I mean, it is a high beta sell-off. It is a run to safety. Whatever side of the coin you want to look at, it's happening this morning. It was, for the most of the week, maybe just looking like some consolidation, but it's looking worse now. As you say, the bond market, we are buying bonds. We're buying the belly of the curve specifically five year in Germany. Those yields are lower by 14 basis points. Perhaps it makes sense that the action is concentrated around the belly because if the data is looking bad, we had Eurozone PMIs come in so close to contraction, a huge disappointment in France and Germany and the overall data. Perhaps we're not going to be higher for longer. Perhaps we can't have the ECB hiking again in September. So again, it makes sense. It's the belly where we're starting to see some of this buying. But again, if anything is high beta, it is selling today. OK, maybe except for stocks. Now we're at the dreaded unch for European equities. Those are unchanged. Again, a bit of a head scratcher. I don't understand why European stocks aren't selling off. Look at the Naki, though. The dollar versus the Naki is gaining nearly 2%. And this is a central bank that hiked by 50 basis points yesterday. But it is getting clobbered, as is the Aussie dollar. So again, those commodity currencies. And again, because the Eurozone data was so bad, it is a lot of euro it is a lot of euro weakness in dollar strength it's kind of the dollar the u.s economy being the least dirty shirt right now critty yeah, certainly something that you're going to see you have a ripple effect into the U.S. right now, starting with the economic data that you just outlined uh, in Europe. I'm going to skip over the futures. We'll come back to that in a second. But the two-year yield is what's catching my eye. The 475 level, again, we've been pricing a much more hawkish Federal Reserve. So that two-year yield has been inching higher and higher to that 5% level. Today, it's down about three basis points. Again, coming back on those recessionary concerns. If you look further out into the curve on the 10-year, for example, you're seeing a much bigger move. So again, volatility already baked into this morning's 
trading session. The dollar, as you mentioned, the strength by all off strength, really coming off of the European currencies. Again, uh, the euro weakness that you just outlined, as well as this commodity currencies, giving the dollar a little bit of strength, even though, by the way, we have had news out of uh, the Federal Reserve and out of, of course, the geopolitical situation that maybe the U.S. is potentially in trouble, too. Janet Yellen, on the other hand, saying, look, maybe we're a little bit more optimistic. It won't be that bad here, but who knows? I'm going to come back to futures here, down about five-tenths of 1%, 4,400 on uh, that level. Danny, I imagine this is just kind of a cash-off uh, take, pulling back from five weeks of gains. It's a Friday. It kind of makes sense. It's rainy outside. That happens in the New York session, so down about five-tenths of 1% this morning. But again, sticking with that theme of gloom, you're seeing the same story in crude. So again, the risk-off sentiment in both commodities and futures are on the same page. About a 68 handle there down, just shy of 2%. Yeah, it's really kind of interesting to assess why are we so gloomy on the economy? Is it some of the PMIs? Is it the data? Is it the BOE yesterday? And on that point, the latest UK PMI data did come in lower than expected today. Retail sales, they unexpectedly rose in May amid some of those mounting inflation fears. And of course, all of this followed a surprise from the BOE hiking 50 basis points, raising its rate to the highest level in 15 years. Well, let's get to someone who knows monetary policy extremely well. It is Sushil Wadwani, CIO of P. Jim Wadwani and former Bank of England MPC member. Sushil, so great to have you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, look, markets after that decision yesterday are pricing something like a 6.1% terminal rate for the BOE. Is that where we need to go? Good morning, Danny. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, I interpret the bank's decision yesterday very much in a stitch in time saves nine type philosophy. Um, they were very anxious to show that they could occasionally be hawkish and that uh, and the message that accompanied uh, this hike was very simple. It was that they, they're now going to do whatever it takes to ensure that inflation gets back to target. Now, uh, as to whether or not they need uh, six percent terminal rate uh, is still very much an open question. Uh, remember, there are two narratives playing out in the UK. One possibility is that inflation has genuinely become embedded into wage and price setting, higher inflation expectations. And if that is true, uh, then you could easily get to 6.1 percent. The other narrative is that these the surprising data that we've seen in the last three or four months where inflation has come in higher than expected is just merely a matter of delays. We've seen hmm. producer price uh, indices ease meaningfully, and at some point that should come through into consumer prices. And, and maybe that hasn't happened uh, essentially uh, you know, just because of unpredictable timelines. If it right. turns out that the data, uh, that in the inflation data starts now surprising on the downside in the next two or three months, then we're not getting anywhere near 6.1%. Um, so yeah, I think. So, so Sushil, we, we, we need to wait perhaps in that case. But in the meantime, we were just showing a screen of some of the papers in the UK, some of their editorial sections this morning. I got to say, it is pretty brutal. You have the Daily Mail calling Andrew Bailey the bumbling governor, failing Britain. The Telegraph saying people will be hurt by Bank of England's chest thumping blunder. The FT saying the Bank of England's credibility is still on the line. Sushil, does the BOE, does Andrew Bailey have a credibility issue right now? So, uh I think the one thing I've learned over the years is that the British media uh, can occasionally overreact, uh, and, uh, and, and, and and you know sometimes uh, uh, one should learn to sort of fade that noise and focus on the underlying fundamentals. Uh, I mean, whatever has happened is now water under the bridge. We need to look ahead. Uh, the good thing is that the bank is on the case. They've uh, emphasized that they are now going to do whatever it takes to bring uh, inflation down. And what we now need to do is to be patient uh, and, and essentially uh, ensure uh, that we get inflation back to target. So is the right trade-off then, if necessary, Sushil? Should we 
see a BOE that needs to engineer a recession in order to make sure inflation isn't entrenched? So uh, as I was saying earlier, it really depends on which narrative about inflation surprises that you believe more. If you believe the delay hypothesis, i.e. the one where uh, inflation is likely to come down anyway, then a recession is uh, going to prove to be completely unnecessary. Uh, if, on the other hand, it is indeed the case that higher inflation expectations have uh, become embedded within the inflation process, then sadly we know uh, that you need to work extremely hard uh, to essentially change the inflation process and bring inflation expectations down. That tends to be a very painful uh, experience. Uh, and then sadly a recession may well occur uh, under that scenario. Uh, I think we truly don't know. Yeah. And it's very, very important not to overreact uh, to recent developments in, in terms of trying to determine whether or not a recession would be necessary. Yeah, tell that to a day trader. Sushil, talk to us a little bit about the fiscal side of this equation. We know that a lot of the folks uh, are saying, are looking at this inflation, saying, look, this has been an issue in the UK for decades, structurally speaking. When we're talking about perhaps the blunt tools at the disposal of the BOE, how much can the fiscal side really help? So, uh, I mean, it's obviously very important that the fiscal and monetary policy point in the same direction. Uh, you recall that we did uh, see fiscal tightening uh, last November, uh, and uh, I was very reassured uh, by the Chancellor's letter uh, to the Governor yesterday, where he restated uh, the need for budgetary discipline. What does that then in mean? Of, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, what does that then mean in terms of the actual, you know, say, human impact, the cost of living crisis, for example? I've reading, been reading a lot about just how much money it takes to live in London right now, for example. Compare that to some of the inflationary pressures you're seeing around the world in the rest of Europe and in the United States as well. T put into perspective for our global audience and for an American audience just how sticky that kind of inflation is. So, uh, I mean, certainly uh, inflation has proved to be stickier than most of us would have hoped for. Uh, and I think the proximate causes of that were probably the fact that our labor supply shrank more than in many other OECD countries. And the second reason uh, is obviously related to Brexit, where what Brexit has done in, in addition to reducing labor supply is that you've seen much less corporate investment in recent years, which means the productive capacity of the economy shrunk. Uh, and obviously, it's also had an impact on import prices, which have been higher than they would have otherwise been because of non-tariff barriers. Um, and if you put all that together, uh, I think you begin to understand why uh, inflation in the UK has been stickier than elsewhere which is why uh, the bank arguably has to work harder uh, than it might have had to do uh, in different circumstances. Right. Susha, we got some PMI data in from Europe, from Germany, from France. It was weaker than expected. It was contractionary in, in a lot of different areas. And we have a market now that is trading something that looks like recession. Is that a trade you would want to follow, that the European economy is headed towards recession? So uh, if, if a recession happens sort of later in 23 or in 24 in the US, the Eurozone and the UK, this will be the sort of most advertised recession, at least in my professional lifetime. Uh, you know, client perceptions of the possibility of a recession have been high for a considerable period. Uh, it may well occur. Uh, I'm still in the camp of believing that a recession in the US over the next six to 18 months is more likely than not. Uh, but I have to confess uh, that uh, I, you know, I've learned to be more humble about this prediction, essentially because the pandemic has changed a lot of the economic relationships we usually rely upon. What yeah. I've been impressed by in the US is how much wage growth 
uh, has come down without unemployment moving much. And also other measures of labor tightness, like the vacancy unemployment ratio, uh, are well off their peaks, again, without unemployment having moved much. So I think it's important right. to be humble. Uh, you were asking me uh, 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 about the Eurozone, and I didn't mean to deflect your question, but I think the same mechanisms apply there um, in terms of uh, what's been going on in the labor markets. Right. Sushil, I, I love that. I mean, right, because so many people have gotten so many calls wrong. No, kind of no one is, is really immune to having uh, misinterpreted where this economy was going post-COVID. Sushil, thank you so much for joining Kriti and me this morning. Sushil Wadwani, their CIO of PGM Wadwani. Now coming up, Neil Brown, head of equities at GIB Asset Management, joins us next. Does he want to make the recession trade? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with Robert Friedland, the founder of Global Mining Management. That coming up at 10.40 a.m. New York, 3.40 in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Global stocks headed for their biggest weekly decline in more than three months as the latest data add fuel to recession woes. Joining us now is Neil Brown, head of equities at GIB Asset Management. Neil, thank you for joining us this morning. This pullback that we're seeing in, in equities around the world, how much of this is just technicals? The stock market taking a little bit of a breather as opposed to a real fundamental worry? Well, good morning and, and thank you for having me on. Listen, I think we need to put this in the context of, of the rally we've had, of how uh, much markets have moved, particularly certain parts of the market have moved into these kind of prints. Um, we are obviously, we've had a long run. I think the data this morning, particularly the PMI, it, it is still expansionary. It's clearly a disappointment and France is, is below 50, but I think we are still expansionary. I think we still forecast uh, through the near term decent growth this year. Uh, 2.8 this year globally, 3% next. So I think we see fragile growth. I think we need to be cautious about the risk of recession. And if you look at the rally that we've had, there have been pretty significant swings on the way up to, to 14, 15%. And I think we might just be, you know, this is fragile. This is a very narrow rally. Uh, and I think we should expect these kind of pullbacks as, as risk looks a little more dangerous. Neil, I often joke with Danny that, given that she's a fellow American, that Europeans are never bullish on the stock market, especially <laughs> when it comes to American stocks. Neil, what is it going to take you to turn bullish? So we are uh, pretty bullish, I have to say. I think the market overall, um, you know, we have reset. We're at 17 times forward earnings. We're up 14, 15 percent. We know the Nasdaq's up uh, significantly more than that. And growth is, is clearly led. But it, it really is narrow. It's five stocks doing the the lion's share of the work. So what makes us bullish here is seeing that broaden out, seeing there's only about 30% of stocks ahead of the benchmark. That's the, the lowest since 1991. So we would want to see broaden out into those resilient growth names, see some confidence, understand, have some faith in what the Fed is doing. They are going to hold rates uh, higher for longer, but see and start to reward those pockets of resilient, uh, high quality growth where they're there. Well, Neil, can I push back on that for a very quick second? When the conversation of, of breath really comes to play, some people are making the argument that this is the one time that's the exception to the rule because there's so much fundamental money, investment money, going into this AI race that has then fueled the chip rally, the big tech rally. Is this the exception to the rule? Could that argument be made? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we have to acknowledge five names doing all of the work that we do have. Uh, I don't want to say the word boom because it usually comes along with another word quite quickly, but this is clearly a strong move for AI. This is clearly, uh, it's an interesting time, right? It's still the picks and shovels. It's still the, the investment in the training. It's not the inference. It's not the, the diggers, if you like, from the picks and shovels. So we do need it to broad out into software names. We do need to see these tools being used in the real world economy. Uh, and, and that's why I think we get these swings. But we do think it can broaden out. We do think there's really strong, resilient growth. We use secular and, and structural themes to find them. We have a lot of really powerful themes that can run through cycle, and we think that's where it broadens out into. 
You know, this week, looking at some of those AI names that are kind of the, if you squint really hard, you can call it AI. Some of those actually did sell off. There are a few in Asia. There's one in the U.S., Symbotic. It fell 8% yesterday, 9% the day before. Have you been tracking of any of these? Is this kind of a good sign if some of these type of names are, are coming back to reality? I don't think it hurts. You, do, you can't have it all one way, and we're, and we're seeing that today, right? It doesn't hurt if you get a little bit of sense into the market. I think you're seeing a great deal more skepticism about just the phrase AI. People are really digging in. What do you mean by that? Where are you in the space? Where are you taking value? Uh, we focus on, um, the, as I say, the picks and shovels, NVIDIA's, ASML's, those that are at this stage, and showing, you know, a lot of this was, was a bit of hope at the beginning, but we've seen good numbers. We've seen four billion in data center from NVIDIA. There is numbers behind this. Obviously, we've got a big outlook and a lot of hope, but we are starting to see actual revenues from these. I would love to know how you trade NVIDIA. So did you hold it before the rally? And if so, could you keep holding it? Did it set off triggers like this is becoming too much of my portfolio because of how much of it is rally? Have you added to it? So we did hold it. We, we've held it since we launched this fund. So uh, a couple of years now, and we have trimmed on the way up. Um, we actually had to trim last year because of the duration and the growth and just the risk that it was carrying. Um, and then you get the, you know, when something goes up this much, obviously it becomes a big part of the portfolio. And that is also, I think, what you're going to see. That's part of the broadening out story is people taking profits in these very successful names and saying, OK, that's a big part of the portfolio. Where can I start to look at, at getting the risk elsewhere? OK, so if that becomes too big, you want to look elsewhere, where specifically do you want to go? So we still like ASML, that's another stock that uh, I've owned in various incarnations for, for more than a decade, a fantastic business, poured uh, a lot of money into trying to solve the miniaturization of chips. There's 30% CAGR in uh, lithography equipment, they've got extreme ultraviolet, these machines are selling for 180 million, they've got the next ones out at 380 million. about the China risk though? There is a very clear China risk, and that is something we're monitoring day by day, as are the company. Um, we think they'll do okay. They've done quite well at, at, at shipping out some of the, uh, the lower technology, still very good technology solutions. But, yeah, they'll have to navigate that. I think they've been very clear on their position, mm. but uh, they'll need to navigate that. Hey, Neil, thanks so much for stopping by the studio on this Friday. Enjoy the rest of your Friday and your weekend. Thank you. That is Neil Brown, head of equities at GIB Asset Management. Now, coming up, we're going to talk about the market-moving events that you need to watch out for today on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Let's take a look at what's ahead today. ECB's Fabio Panetta will be speaking at 8.45 a.m. Eastern time. Then we're going to get U.S. PMI data at 9.45 a.m. President Biden and Prime Minister Modi meeting with corporate executives. That will happen at 11.45 Finally, we're going to get some Fed speak. We're going to be hearing from Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester at 1.40 p.m. So that is the diary for today, Kriti. Yeah, a lot to watch for on the macro front. And, of course, a lot coming up next week as well. I want to get to some of the stocks we're watching in the pre-market, get to the micro front here. One of the big names is 3M. The ticker for our radio audience is MMM, higher by about 3.3%. They paid are paying $10 billion to settle uh, their PFA's water pollution suits. Essentially, these are the so-called forever chemicals. It's manufactured for decades. Uh, the accusation here was that they polluted drinking water supplies across the United States. Now, the reason the stock is higher is, one, uh, because this amount was previously reported and expected. The second piece of the equation is that it is a smaller amount than a lot of analysts had, had really kind of put away for. So good news there from an investor point of view for 3M. I almost want to get to Ford here because you are seeing some layoffs uh, in the works, down about six-tenths of one percent in those shares, pre preparing another round, this time to see U.S. salaried workers in their gas engine division. This comes after several other rounds before. They're really taking cost efficiency into high gear, so not not necessarily a positive for that stock or that company. Danny, I'm going to end very quickly on CarMax earnings. They are reporting after the close. We know that used vehicles have been a key source of inflation, but now it looks like perhaps they're still going to have that revenue read through into CarMax higher by 1.2% this morning. Yay, we can finally maybe afford uh, used cars. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, I, can, I, can, I can barely even uh, uh, buy a flat or apartment in New York, let alone a car, so hopefully that'll change. All right. <laughs> That's it for Early Edition. More surveillance is ahead. This is Bloomberg.